Thank you very much, David, and thank you all for coming to my talk. Actually, I don't give many public talks. Probably, most. Uh, this is my fourth or fifth public talk uh, because it's very difficult. It's really hard to make public talks for most of professional astronomers and for me too. But uh, since I was asked to, to present a talk about exoplanets or something interesting related to my own research, well, I said, okay, to David, I cannot. <laughs> He's a good friend, old friend, and actually we met today for the first time. <laughs> so the world is really going crazy. So you know people for 10, I have a collaborator, we published papers for 15, 20 years, and I never met him yet. We never met. We didn't even Skype, so I don't know his face. But, but we have been working together for 15 years or more. Well, this is a very interesting subject because if you hear someone talking about stars which have planetary systems, exoplanets, a very simple and naive question will come up to your mind and say, are these stars different from the rest? Imagine that stars which do not have planets and we have also stars which have planets, so what's the difference? Do you need any special stars or special physical conditions to form planets around those stars? Or is there any exchange of, of physics between planetary systems and stars so maybe the planets influence stars? And basically, when you form stars, you form them with different masses, rotation, magnetic fields. And you know perfectly that stars are born in a cloud have the same chemical composition. If you have a big cloud, you form stars, and all the stars are supposed to have the same chemical composition, the same content of iron, oxygen, silicium, or whatever. Now, what happens if we have planets around them? So again, can I post the same question? Will these stars have again the same composition, or it will be different? It can be different because the planets will influence, or it can be different because the process of planet formation will change rotation or whatever. So we know there are many things happening in the universe. We have no idea, we have no clues, but this is a very simple question which we post and which we want to understand. What is this uh, interaction between stars and planet systems? And it's been already when the first exoplanet was discovered in 95, and soon after this, we realized that there are some strange uh, things uh, happening with stars that have access to planets. Basically, if we have characteristics of stars, which is mass, of rotation, magnetic fields, chemical composition, and planets, again, their masses, orbital parameters, physical structure, chemical composition, there are all sorts of relations. How do we know? if any of these parameters is influenced by any of these parameters that we have above. So whether the rotation of a star somehow will change the mass distribution in a planetary system, orbital parameters, physical structure of planets, their composition. So it's, all sorts of things can happen. If you go to models, it's a complete mess because with models, it's really impossible to figure out when you build a planetary system, it's a chaotic process you can change slightly parameters and you will end up with totally different configuration, orbital parameters, mass distribution of planets. So it's a big forest, it's a jungle, it's not a forest, it's a jungle of parameters. And, and you know, there are different groups building um, planetary systems with models and they come up with different answers. But our goal, the, that we basically the project that we started 15 years ago, in 2000, with Michel Mayor and my colleagues from Portugal, is to try to understand whether the stars that have planet systems are different. And it turned out that this is so hard to do. It's really a difficult project that we are doing. And I will explain you why. One of the things that we have discovered very, very recently, and after so many years, is that there's a very clear relationship between the period of planet and a mass, and that relation depends on the content of heavy element in a star. 
So stars, which are, we call them metal poor, that have less heavy elements than the sun, a factor of two, three, four less heavy elements like iron, silicon. So for those stars, there's a very clear relationship between the period and the mass of a giant planet. So, but this was obvious. This, uh, this is just very, uh, is a very, one year ago that we discovered this. And apparently, the models also suggest that if you build a planetary system around the star, which has a composition very different from the sun, the planets will have a different composition too. We know that many stars have more oxygen, more carbon, more nitrogen compared to the sun, factor of two, three, more. So obviously planets around those stars are going to be very different. They will have a different physical structure, different atmospheres, different chemical composition. So this is a clear example from one of the papers of Jade von Carter comparing a, a planet in a system which has a carbon over oxygen ratio of 0.9, which we call, let's say, there's much more carbon than oxygen, a factor of three. And this difference is seen in the amount of sulfur. So it's quite surprising to say, why don't you see it in oxygen and so on, but you see it in, in sulfur. So this, this, all these relations are so complicated, they're so difficult to understand how this difference in carbon and oxygen ends up with the difference of sulfur. The structure of this is the, is the global structure of the, of the planet. But the most difficult question is this. If we are talking about characteristics of stars, then are we talking about today, one giga years ago, three, four? When, 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 when we are trying to relate stars with planets, obviously we are dealing with today's observations, and we have this information today but we have no idea, we have no clue what happened when the star was one giga years old with the planetary system, when they were born, because the planets, it takes about 10, 5, 30, 40 million years to build a planetary system, in the pre-Masic when the star is still very young. Now, maybe there were differences when the star was young, but these differences are gone. Maybe today what we are looking today, the stars and planets, everything is perfect. You have an equilibrium, but who knows, maybe not very long time ago, something was strange in the system. So this is a very difficult thing that we cannot handle for the moment. But another more difficult question is, what if the great majority of stars, and now it's possible that more than 80% of stars, the sun-like stars, have uh, small mass planets like the Earth? So maybe all of them, we don't know. Now, then it's even more difficult because to study the problem, to compare stars with and without planets, we need a control sample. We need to have stars which do not have planets, so then you can compare them with those which do have planets. So it, what happens if it turns out that all the stars have planets, so we don't have a control system. So this is another problem that we are facing today already, because 10 years ago we had no idea that we can face this. So, which means that we need huge statistics, we need lots of planetary systems with many orbital parameters, all kinds of systems, and which is much more important than what we are trying to do already 10 years is to get very, very precise parameters of stars and planetary systems. We have to push the precision, like measuring effective temperature with the precision less than 1%. And we are actually doing it. We couldn't do it 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, we had a precision of measuring temperatures of stars, sun-like stars, like 2%, and now it's 1%. It makes a huge difference for us. Maybe for you, it's more or less it's, it's the same 1% or 2%. But for us, it's really a big difference. And we achieved it only in 10 years. So 10 years working hard, lots of students, PhD students, postdocs, and other. And finally, we have 1% percent precision in measuring parameters of, of stars. And we have been studying chemical composition of stars with planetary systems, and I will divide it. The, the, we had three different periods. So the first period from 96, 2000, and then 2001, 2006. So this is a period, basically, when only 10, 15 planets were known. And one of my colleagues, Guillermo Gonzalez, realized just from picking up the first four, five planetary systems, he realized that the stars that have those giant planets, hot Jupiters, 
contain two times more metals, like iron, than the rest of the stars. So he was the first to pick up and say, hey guys, there's something going on. Why all these stars are metal rich? They have hot Jupiters, and they have two times more metals than the sun. But this was a period that only very few planets were known, so we couldn't do any statistics. And by 2000, we had already 40, 50 planetary systems. So we started a very extensive research of stars with exoplanets. And the first convincing evidence that we published in 2001 is taking two samples of stars, those which do not have giant planets, or at least they were not detected during your five years, could be they have planets, but they are far away, or they are small mass, so we cannot detect them. But anyway, we are comparing these two samples and the sample of stars that have hot Jupiters, and we found a very significant difference in their metallicity, so in the content of heavy elements. So this difference was, here was 0.15, what we call a metal content, and it was minus 0.1, these two different distributions. So about two times difference in, in, a, in a content of metal. This was confirmed by Deborah Fisher and Jeff Valenti in 2005. And you can see that about 30% of stars with planets in this graph have a metal content more than two times than the sun. They are really metal rich. And then further, we, we have been continuing this research for many years. But finally, the most interesting thing was the fact that we discovered that this is not applied to low-mass planets. Apparently, if you go to Earth-like planets or Neptunes, this correlation between metallicity and the presence of planets disappears. So there is, this is flat. You see, this is flat. So for planets with masses less than 30 solar, you get a flat distribution. There is no relation between the content of Planet, uh, the content of metals in the star and the presence of planets. So this is very interesting. Uh, but uh, what happened with different chemical elements? So we were so naive in the beginning. We were comparing uh, uh, abundances of all sorts of elements, cobalt, titanium, calcium, scandium, and everything. So we were just making all these crazy plots, trying to find whether the stars have different abundance of silicon or carbon or whatever compared with stars without planets. We ended up with no results, nothing for We have been working for five, six years, publishing lots of papers. Nothing was coming out from this. So we found basically they are the same. No difference in for any chemical elements. But from time to time, this was a more extended sample from HARPS survey. But from time to time, people would come up with very interesting results like this one. Uh, I was a student of Deborah Fisher, I think Sarah Robinson, showing that there is a difference for silicium. So they found that silicon is enhanced in stars with planets. And we couldn't confirm this. Other so there was a maze, but nothing was very clear. But why you would expect a difference? So one of the reasons was pointed out by uh, Moiron Smith is in a system, where you have a matter close to the star, which is very hot, and a cold matter, which is uh, far away, you lack volatiles in, hot plan in, in cold planets, in, in giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. So basically, all the elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen volatiles are locked in these big planets. And the refractory elements, which we call iron, magnesium, silicon, they have a very high condensation temperature. You condense them into dust grains at very high temperature. So all these elements are locked in small mass planets. This is why the Venus, Mercury, and Earth, Mars, they contain the heavy elements, and the rest are gone and locked in, in Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. Well, this is interesting, but then we knew that part of the matter, which is close to the star, which is here, is a cricket, is gone, it's, it, it goes to the star. And in, in which case, my colleagues would, would claim that you will find stars with less carbon, nitrogen, oxygen compared with refractory elements. So they were predicting a trend like this. So less volatiles 
compared with refractory elements. Nevertheless, this was again, there was a debate. A group from Japan came saying that this doesn't exist, we don't find it, etc. So this was going on again for another 10 years. So for 10 years, there were hard debates whether this relation between uh, the presence relative abundances of refractories and volatiles in the atmospheres of stars is there. Because if you find something peculiar, it would mean there was a matter accretion. Then you can measure abundances and have an idea about planets and their composition and so on. You can make very far going conclusions if you really find that there's something strange in the atmosphere. Finally, my colleagues from Brazil came up with this interesting idea that if you go to the sun, if you go to the sun, again do the same plot, compare volatiles with refractories, you again find a very significant difference. And they claim that in other stars like the sun, you really have a difference between stars with and without planets. So, but they find an opposite effect. They found that there are more volatiles than refractories. Just an opposite that was found by Smith. And they claimed that this is because you lack refractory elements in small mass planets. And what is accreted is rich in volatiles. So the matter which is uh, accreted by stars is depleted in refractory elements. And there was a very straightforward conclusion from this paper that if you find a star with this, with this kind of a trend, it would mean there are small mass planets around that star. Even if you don't see them in radio velocity surveys, even if you don't discover them, but simply from this, simply from studying the chemical composition of the stellar atmosphere, you make this conclusion that there are planets around the star. Because you see this strange thing, which is a signature that was an accretion of a matter, and that matter was poor in carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And why it was poor? Because uh, it was locked in big planets, and what was accreted is a signature that there are Earth-like planets around the star. So there was again a big debate. So we went to find these results, and as one of my students published a paper based on very high quality data of stars with and without planets, and he found nothing, no effect. So this is a classical, typical debate which is happening today in astronomy. So you find this and others come to attack you and then, then you go attack them. So this is going on and on and on and on. But finally, I think we have an answer to all these things right uh, this year. We can explain why these things are happening now. Anyway, so we found that um, apparently the stars that have exoplanets that we are discovering from HARP survey and so on, they are older than the same stars where we don't find planets in a solar neighborhood. So even in the volume limited sample, for some reasons, the stars that have planetary systems are older. And, and the consequence, why they are older, and we determined their orbits, galactic orbits. And it turned out that there is a relation between the, the, the galactocentric distance and the age of a star. And we concluded that these stars come from the central part of the galaxy. So they are born there, and they migrate to solar neighborhood. And the reason of this abundance difference is because there is a gradient of chemical composition in a galaxy. The stars close to the central part have different abundances compared with stars which are formed far away. Even the solar type stars, the same age, same mass, everything have quite a different chemical composition. And this is really interesting finding. And we are going to make now a press release for this because the paper has just been accepted in letters in ANA. So we will see uh, what is happening with this. So, and, and the second thing that we also discovered is if you compare the, the, the amount of what we call alpha elements, alpha elements are silicium, magnesium, sulfur, these elements are produced in massive stars and they are expelled in type 2 supernova explosions. So the alpha elements are those elements which are built from helium nuclei. So helium nuclei stick together and they build oxygen, carbon, silicium, sulfur, magnesium. Okay, so, and we found apparently that the stars with planets, 
but the metal poor stars with planets have more alpha elements than single stars, than single stars, and this effect is again only seen for low mass planets, so like planets like the Earth. So this is again something which is, we were not expecting. So somehow, if you go to low metallicities, if you go to stars which have three, four times less metals than the Sun, you suddenly discover that these stars are, uh, they, they host planets, small mass planets. So this is a statistical result which we clearly see here. We don't know why. So this is a result which has to be explained by models anyway, but this is something which is coming now. Uh, one of the reasons that we, we get to those things because we increase the precision of measurements of abundances to a level which has never been done before. So we can measure abundances of alpha elements with a precision of 2% or 3%. It's really, really high because of the quality spectra that we are using basically based on HARPS is uh, really the, probably the best spectrograph in the world. Very high resolution spectra. You get signal to noise 800, 700, 1000 for solar type stars. So this is really a new window for measuring a composition of these stars and stellar parameters. Now, I want to draw your attention to the most interesting chemical element that we have in the universe. It's the most amazing, most interesting element that I consider, not only me, the lithium is the most interesting element. Why? Uh, so I show you the spectra of sun-like stars. This is Arcturus, the sun, and one of the metal-rich stars. Here is what we expect to have lithium. And these are the spectral lines which are blended. It's a very tough region. So to measure the abundance of lithium, which is here, you have to perfectly understand the whole region, make a very good quality spectra, make, make the feeds, and so on and so on. It's a very tough work to, to work with lithium. But we do this, we do this because lithium is the only element which can be destroyed in normal stars after the star has been formed. So going to iron, magnesium, silicon, any other chemical element you take, the abundance of this element in the stellar atmosphere is going to be the same during the whole evolution. Nothing is able to change a composition of an element like iron, magnesium, aluminium in classical models of stars. If there is no gravitational settling, some really fancy physical processes that can um, change a bit, not a lot, but just a bit abundances of those heavy elements. But lithium is the only element because you destroy lithium when the temperature is more than two and a half million degrees. And apparently in stars you have convective cells. So if you get lithium in the surface, Convection will take it down to the core, to, to these layers, where the temperature is more than 2.5 million, and will destroy it. So depending on the strength, on, 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 depending on the, on the height and the mass of these convective cells, you may or you may not destroy it. Okay, so everything will depend on the convection. It can kill the lithium, or the lithium can survive in the floor. And apparently, the efficiency of this mixing depends on the rotation of a star. And again, some other mechanism, the most important effect is a rotation. So rotation can change the surface composition of lithium. And that is the, that's what makes lithium very interesting. And so apparently, this is the reason that we can use lithium to relate to the formation of planets, because planets and rotation and the star are really linked. Once the star is formed, 1% of mass is locked in planets, but 90% of angular momentum is also gone with planets. So in a protoplanetary system, when you form planets, 90% or 95% of angular momentum, rotational energy, is taken by planets. A star is left with a very little rotation. So this is the reason that we use lithium to connect uh, rotation in, in stars with exoplanet system. But lithium is also very interesting because this is the most puzzling element to resolve a problem with Big Bang. All the models predict a very high abundance of lithium during the galactic chemical evolution, but what we observe is actually this. 
It's a huge gap between what is predicted by Big Bang and what is observed. So, so far today, no one is able to explain this depletion. We don't know the reason why the lithium is 10 times less than it is predicted by Big Bang models. No explanation for this. And then when we go to solar metallicities, which is today, we see a huge dispersion in lithium abundances in stars like the sun, a factor of 200, 500 difference. And the most important is the, the fact that the, there are stars which have the same mass, the same composition, same, everything is the same, but they have very different abundances of lithium. So everything is the same, iron, magnesium, oxygen, and whatever, age is the same, age is the same. But the lithium, 100 times difference in lithium abundance. No other chemical element shows something like this. It's only lithium. And it goes back to the history of a star formation, rotational history, or whoever. We don't have any ideas why this is happening. This is one of the biggest challenges in the evolution of stars, sun-like stars, and uh, rotational history, especially rotational history. And we make this bridge between formation of planets and observations of lithium exactly for this reason. And also because observations of clusters, stellar clusters, show that apparently when the star is one giga years old, this is 10 to nine, the age of the star, one giga year, some stars keep the abundance of lithium constant during of the rest of the evolution, but others immediately de destroy it. And again, we don't understand why we have this bimodality. So something is happening with stars when they are young, or it's happening when they are evolving, but something is happening with the stars, so it will kill lithium, or it will be preserved. And our idea 10 years ago that this puzzle is related to the formation of planets. So we had this idea for a long time that something is, has to do with planetary systems. Why? Because the sun, our sun, has a much lower lithium than predicted by models. And the sun has a planetary system. So we knew this. And this is why we were suspecting that something, there is some relation between planets and, uh, and, and stars. And this is another interesting observation from Jeremy King and colleagues. As a very famous binary system called 16 Cygni A and B. is a system where 16 Cygni B has a planet and the 16 Cygni A has no planet. And there is a factor of five, six difference between abundances of lithium. And two stars are identical. This is twins. They are twins. They have the same composition, same age, everything is a binary system. There's a huge difference in the lithium abundance because one of the stars has a planet, another one doesn't have. So apparently the rotational history, formation, everything was diff completely different in these two stars. And so we went to attack the problem of lithium in stars with exoplanets. And these are the series of papers where people claiming that there is a difference between lithium in stars with planets and without planets. And the people who claim that there is no difference. So you can see the, 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 the papers, they start in 2000 and going down to this 2008, and then we continue. So this debate is apparently still going on, although the last latest paper still claim that there is a difference in lithium abundance between stars with and without planetary systems. We, uh, now, so this is the, perhaps the most convincing evidence that we found in 2009 the red dots are stars with planetary systems and the empty uh, circles are stars which do not have planets, detected planets. And we found that almost all the stars with planetary systems have very low lithium abundances, very low, depleted at a factor of 100 compared to all these guys. So this was very strong, very convincing evidence that uh, there is something going on with this. But then later, we also found that this effect is true only for giant planets. If the star has a giant planet, then indeed the lithium is very low. But if you go to low mass planets, the effect disappears. So it's like for iron and heavy elements. As I mentioned, 
for heavy elements, we see this interesting effect that uh, the uh, stars with exoplanets have much higher abundance content of heavy elements compared with, sing uh, with single stars. Now, we see a similar thing for lithium. So all the effects, this relation between star with and without planets is much stronger or obvious or evident for stars which have giant planets. So apparently giant planets do the effect. They, they can't change a stellar evolution. They can't change their rotation. They can't change things in the system. They can affect uh, the star. So this is uh, quite uh, interesting. And um, we also found some peculiar sun-like stars the stars which may have a fragile isotope of lithium is an isotope which destroyed in the atmosphere, but it appears if you treat a planet or a, or a planetary matter. Because this isotope is so fragile, you can destroy it in 2 million Kelvin. And once the star is formed, even before the formation of a star, convection kills the whole lithium-6 isotope in the star. So it arrives to the main sequence without lithium-6. But suddenly we found that some stars with planetary systems have lithium-6 isotope, which means there's a clear signature that was an accretion of a planet or a planetary matter or whatever. There was something accreted. And apparently models do predict some engulfment or accretion of big bodies of planets. Now, for instance, you have a process like planetary migration in, in a dense gas and dust accretion disk. You have a drag effect, you have a torture, and so in a time scale of 10 to 20 million years, in only 20 million years, the planet will go and collapse with a star. You can also have a process which is called planetary migration with dynamical friction. And this is in a system when you have lots of planetesimals, but no gas. So this is because of the interaction of a planet, giant planet, with small planetesimals in one giga year, in one billion year, you can accrete a giant planet with a star. It's a very slow process, and it takes about one year, a year to, 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 to take place. And finally, you can have a multi body interactions in those systems where you build very fast, in five, 10 million years, you build few giant planets, like a Jupiter. So obviously, they cannot survive in a system, so they fight big giants, they cannot be together in the same system. And because of this interaction, in 100 million years, one of the planets goes to the star, another one is kicked off from the system. So all these kind of funny things happen in, in, in systems where you build few giants simultaneously in five, 10 million years. So they have to, something has to happen in the system. Then you also have this process, which is multi-body interactions plus planetesimal disk, so it's an even more complicated scenario where you have a disk with a lot of small planetesimals plus a few giant planets. So in those systems, again, in one giga year, you can have a, one of the planets going to the star, another one is kicked off from the system, becoming a free-floating planet, which is quite possible. This population of free-floating planets that we discover today it comes actually from, uh, from stars. So maybe those planets which we find, the free-floating planets, are not formed in the interstellar medium. But they were formed around stars, but they were kicked off from the system because of the interaction, multiple interactions. So anyway, we have a tool to discover whether the star has accreted a planet or not. And that tool is a lithium-6, the isotope, which is the only isotope, which is the only chemical element that you can find in the atmosphere as evidence that something happened. Well, there is another element, this is deuterium. Deuterium is also very fragile. You destroy deuterium in one million degrees. So deuterium survives only in brown dwarfs. So if you treat a planet, you will also have deuterium in the stellar atmosphere. But discovering deuterium is so tough, it's so difficult, it's much more difficult than lithium-6. So we give up, basically, with deuterium. We try to find if there is lithium-6 or not. So this is very funny. This is very nice, and we enjoy these games, and so we play it for years and years. And finally, the most important conclusions that I can draw today, the, the status quo today, is that stars with giant planets are metal rich. We know that. But only the stars with giant planets. So if the star has no giant planet, it has only low mass planets, then it, it's not metal rich. Only the metal richness is not a condition. So put it in this way. 
And stars with giant planets have less lithium. We know this. So these are the, uh, the most important conclusions that I can make. And that metal poor stars with low mass planets have more alpha elements like silicium and sulfur and magnesium and so on. So this is, uh, so I would say today we know only these three things. We are certain about these three observational facts. Nothing else. Uh, the rest is really, I mean, there's so many things going on in the field. People publishing articles about peculiar chemical elements and so on and so on, but nothing is so clear, not certain, except these three observational facts that I can outline today. Well, probably this is all about stars with planets and without planets. I, I don't want to go into more details because, especially, I don't want to talk about things which are not certain. So I, I decided only to speak about what we, we can put our hand today. We can put our hand and say, OK, the stars with giant planets are metal-rich. This is established. This is true. So this can go to textbooks already. This can go to textbooks. About lithium, 70%, 60%. So it's, there is still a chance to debate these results with better data, more statistics, and so on. We'll see what is happening with lithium. But today, we are almost certain that this is maybe true. And about metal poor stars with low mass planets having more alpha elements, this is a very fresh, very new result. So again, we need more statistics. We need more data to confirm this. So far, this has been based on a HARPS database that we have, which is the best quality spectral database available today. And we are working with this uh, 1,200 1, stars from this uh, database. OK, so these are the three main important results that I wanted to outline today. Thank you very much. <laughs>